Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. When one looks at the book of Revelation, we see that the Antichrist is going to do many signs, wonders, miracles. And the purpose for all of these signs is to lead people astray. Speaking to people who are seeking the supernatural instead of seeking the truth. So let me ask you a question. Are you seeking biblical truth? If you're not, then you will be easily deceived by the enemy. The most important thing for you to live a godly life is scriptural truth. And that's why our organization exists. To focus on the Word of God, believing that the Word of God, it's truth and it contains power. And whenever one studies the Word of God, there is always always going to be a good outcome. For we know that the word of God never returns void, meaning it's never empty. It's not ever something that has no effect. Studying the word of God is one of the best ways that you can invest your life. It always produces that which is good according to God's mindset. Well, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Matthew and chapter 12. The book of Matthew and chapter 12. Now, we are going to see and we have seen that there's been a a disagreement between Yeshua, that is Jesus Christ, and the leaders of Israel. But I want to emphasize something. This, This disagreement, this conflict, by and large, is not between the Jewish people, but rather the leaders. And here's the problem. We're going to see in a moment that he's going to speak to two different but related group of leaders. And these two related groups of leaders, they have something in common. And that is, they are not faithful to the revelation of God. Well, look with me to that 12th chapter, and we're going to begin in verse 38. The book of Matthew, chapter 12, and verse 38. We read these words. Then certain ones, not all, but certain ones of the scribes and the Pharisees, they answered. Now, Messiah was speaking about judgment. He was speaking about having a life full of works, good things, from God's standpoint. Taking biblical truth and applying it to our life so that there is a good, a godly, and a holy outcome. One that manifests the God's glory. But the scribes and the Pharisees, these weren't interested in that truth. They weren't interested in that instruction. No, they answered and said, Teacher, we want from you a sign to see. And the implication here is they wanted to choose the sign. They wanted to be in control. They wanted to to control Yeshua. And that's how many people are today. They will believe in him. They will serve him as long as they're really in charge. As long as they're getting what they want. Things are going to their plan. To what they believe is this destiny that they have. But this destiny destiny is nothing other than their own selfish will rooted in a carnal nature rather than in the revelation of the truth of God. So they say to him, Teacher, we want from you a sign to see. 
Look now at verse 39. But, and this word means in contrast to that, he is not in agreement with what they want. But he answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation sign seeks. So an adulterous and evil generation, they seek a sign. Now, we need to pay attention to those two words, evil and adulterous. The word evil here means that which is against the word of God, that which is not related to the word of God. So Messiah speaks to them and say, you're the leaders and you are leading this generation not to truth, but to that which is in opposition to the will of God. And then he has that word adultery. Now, obviously, there is a physical adultery between a man and a woman who's not his wife. But here, this term adultery is much more related to spiritual adultery. And what does that mean? It means we're talking about idolatry. Prophetically, we see so frequently in the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the minor prophets, that more often than not, when they speak about adultery, they're speaking and referring to idolatry. And idolatry is always a religious attempt to get what you want. To be in control, idolatry is always a religious expression that meets with the desires of the one who is the idolater. We need to be people who submit to truth, who base our life upon the revelation of Scripture, not on some prophetic falsehood that some idol is supposedly about. So he says here, a evil and adulterous generation seeks a sign, but he says, and a sign will not be given to her, meaning to this evil and adulterous generation, except the sign of Jonah the prophet. Now, what was the sign of Jonah the prophet. You can't understand this passage of scripture unless you know what he's speaking about. If you read carefully the book of Jonah, you will find that Jonah was rebellious. We all know this. God said, go to Nineveh. And where did he want to go to? Tarsus. Why? The scripture says emphatically that he was fleeing from the presence of God. Why? Jonah did not have a Torah obedient heart. What do I mean by that? He did not have a heart established by the love of God. There is a close inherent relationship between the law of God and the love of God. We've talked about that many times. When we look at the two primary commandments of the Torah, the law of God, what are these two primary commandments that all the rest are related to? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. What do you hear? Love. So Jonah did not have a Torah obedient heart, one that reaches out, having received God's love, reaching out with that love for others. Jonah wanted to go to another place, Tarshish, so that God's judgment would fall upon his enemy. But these people were not the enemies of God. And what happened to Jonah? Well, keep reading. We're going to see something very interesting because he says, look now to verse 40. For just as Jonah was in the belly of that fish three days and three nights, thus the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. Now, remember I asked you a question. Do you know what the sign of Jonah is? When you read the book of Jonah carefully, yes, we see that whale swallowed him up. The scripture never uses the term whale. It uses simply the term fish, a great fish. 
And Jonah was there in that, as we saw, belly of the fish, three days and three nights. A common question I receive is, did Jonah live three days in the belly of that fish? And the answer is, no, he did not. He died. How do we know that? Well, if you look at Jonah chapter 2, where did Jonah descend to? When we study that book, we find that he went down to Yafo, or in English we say Joppa. And we find that he went down into a boat, and down into the lower parts of the boat. And then he was thrown down into the water, and he went down into the fish's belly. But what's important is that his descent continued on. He went down to what location? The word of God says he went to Sheol. What is Sheol? It is the place of the dead where everyone at that time would go when they died. So Jonah died. And the sign of Jonah is that he was resurrected after three days and three nights. And Messiah is saying, you want a sign? I'll give you a sign. It's going to be my resurrection. And what an important sign that is. Why? Because we know something. If you study the teachings of the Apostle Paul, you know that Paul says repeatedly that it was God, God the Father, who raised his only begotten son from the dead. Now, we know that Messiah could have raised up himself. He says in the word of God, I have the power to lay down my life and I have the power to take it up. But he didn't. He had that power, but he didn't utilize it. It was God, his father, that raised him from the dead. And why is that so important? Here's the theological truth. It was the resurrection of Messiah by God the Father that confirmed everything he said, everything he did, and that perfect work on the cross that speaks to the sufficiency of the cross to redeem and to save eternally. And therefore, the resurrection is vital. And that's why Messiah says, you want a sign? This is the sign you're going to get. Only the sign of Jonah the prophet speaking about his resurrection. Move on now to verse 41. We read, The men of Nineveh, now that's whom Jonah preached to. And Jonah didn't call them to repentance. You never find that in the text. We always hear that. What was Jonah's message? For the people to repent. He never says that. Read the book of Jonah. Don't just listen to what other people say about the book of Jonah or anywhere in the scripture. Read it for yourself. No, the message that Jonah gave was, in 40 days, God was going to overturn the city. Now, this term, lahafoch, can mean to overturn it in destruction, but it also can imply a spiritual change. And apparently, these men of Nineveh, even the king of Nineveh, they wanted to believe in the latter. And therefore, even though they were not called to repent, they only heard a message of judgment. They said, who knows? Maybe God will forgive. Maybe he will be gracious. So they repented in sackcloth and ashes. They fasted. And indeed, God was gracious. God was merciful. So he says, verse 41, the men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment, that is, in judgment day, with this generation. And what will the men of Nineveh do? They will condemn it because they never got a sign, the people of Nineveh, but they responded to what? They responded to the truth of God. And that's the wisest thing a person can do. Respond to the truth. And where do we find truth? We find it only one place, and that is in the scriptural text in the Holy Bible. So he says, look on in the second half of verse 41, because they repented at what? At the charisma, that is the word, the proclamation of Jonah. 
So these individuals, they heard a prophet and they repented. And what does he say? Look at the end of verse 41. And behold, more or greater, however you interpret that word, more than Jonah is here, meaning that Yeshua is greater than Jonah. Let's press on. Verse 42, he gives another example. The king, or excuse me, the queen of the south will rise up in judgment, something very similar, will rise up in judgment with this generation, and she will condemn it because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And that wisdom, it was simply the truth that God had given to him. And this woman, she was queen, and she came probably from the area of, of Sudan or Ethiopia, in that general area in the south, meaning Africa. She traveled all that way because she was interested in the revelation of God. And today, I, I hate to say it, but we tend to be so lazy when it comes to studying God's word. We want everything to be presented in a way that, that we get quickly exactly what we think we need. That is going to lead you to great regret because we need to listen. That's what it says here. Pay attention to the scriptural revelation. She came not requesting a sign. She came only with one desire. And what is that? The word of God says to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And what happens? Behold, one greater than Solomon is here. She came because she wanted to hear wisdom. And that word wisdom is taking the truth of God and applying it properly to your life for the situation that you find yourself within. She wanted to utilize the word of God. That's what wisdom is the utilization of the will of God and the truth of God in your life in order to bring glory to him to fulfill his will. And that's why it says, this woman will stand in judgment and condemn this generation. Well, let's move on to, to verse 43. Now we're going to see an example. He says, but whenever an unclean spirit goes out from a man, he passes through through a dry place seeking rest. Now, why this example now? He is speaking to them as they were an unclean spirit. They go out seeking rest. But what does this word rest mean in this context? Their desire. This unclean spirit, it goes out seeking rest. It goes through a dry place. Dry is not usually good. So it doesn't find what it wants. And then what happens? Notice, it does not find, meaning what it wants. Therefore, verse 44, then it says, I will return to my own house. And whenever I come, he says, Come out, and I will come and find it empty, that means vacant, having been swept and in place. Everything's right. And what does that unclean spirit do? He wants to go in and make situation worse. Why do I say that? Just keep reading. Then he goes and he brings with himself seven spirits, other spirits, worse than himself, that, that they enter and dwell there. And notice what it says. And what happens is this. The last of the man, that man is worse than the former, meaning simply that the situation gets worse. Now, what's Messiah teaching? He's likening that generation and the leadership to this unclean spirit, that goes out, and notice seven. What does seven have to do with purpose? These unclean spirits are about their purpose. And instead of being, and we know that Isaiah the prophet 
spoke about this as well. How the leaders of Israel are not serving the people, not blessing the people, not building up the people, but are destroying the people and utilizing them for what? For their own purpose. This is what this, this type of parable is about. And the final state of man, that is, of Israel, is worse than its former state. That's why he says, look at the end of verse 45. And thus will be also this evil generation. So the unclean spirits, that's the leadership. And the generation has to do with the spiritual condition of the nation of Israel at this time. Let's move to verse 46. Now we have something. We have to make a decision. Do we want to be part of the family of God? And there's only one way to be part of this kingdom family. And how is that? Through a messianic connection. He is, and don't miss this, he is the only way. Now, everything that's being said here is to teach us a biblical truth that's relevant for that situation. See, here's the problem. The, the Jewish people felt that they were a kingdom people by, by birth, by pedigree. And Messiah is going to challenge that because Abraham, Abraham became a child of God. He became one who had a kingdom hope because he entered into a kingdom covenant. The Abrahamic covenant is a covenant of blessing. It speaks about God establishing a kingdom people. And we learn from the Apostle Paul in Galatians 3.16 that it's Messiah. Read Galatians 3.16. It is Messiah Jesus who is the foundation of this Abrahamic covenant. That's what Paul taught. There is an inherent relationship between the Abrahamic covenant and the new covenant. Now, he speaks here. Notice what happens. And then, as he was speaking to the crowd, in the midst of that, behold, this is the third time that word appears here, behold, his mother and his brothers. Now, this word brothers can also imply sisters as well. They were standing outside. Now, I would circle that word for standing. Why? It is in a very unique grammatical construction. Now, most teachers, they don't even pay attention to these grammatical constructions. But it's in the Greek pluperfect. You say, what's important about that? The Greek pluperfect shows remoteness. It shows something that is far further away, remote, than what we would normally think when we consider something from our own vantage point, from our own perspective, our own way of thinking. Now, you would think that his mother, his family is visiting him, and he would be so excited, he would want to run out and speak to them. But notice what the scripture reveals. Verse 43, 40, excuse me, verse 46. Behold, his mother and his brothers and probably sisters were standing outside. And they were seeking him to speak, meaning they wanted to speak with him. Therefore, a certain one said to him, Behold, your mother and your brothers, meaning also your sisters, are outside, and there's a change, outside standing. Now it's just the normal, perfect grammatical construction. And what's the perfect? Well, it should show how much they wanted to speak with him. Why do I say that? Because the perfect speaks about a event. It's a verb. It's a happening. And this happening began in the past. It's still taking place and it's going to extend in the future. And all of this is show a determination for his family to see him, to speak with him. Even though they had that strong desire, notice his response. And this is where the wisdom. And Hebrew would say, Hinei hat lekach. Here's the teaching part of this passage. 
once more. Your mother and your brothers and sisters are standing outside seeking you to speak. Verse 48. But he answered and said to the one who was speaking with him, Who is my mother and who are my brother? Brothers, and then notice verse 49. He answered his own question. It says, and stretching his hand unto who? Unto his disciples, he said, behold. Over and over, we see this word, behold. Something of great significance. Something that we need to focus in on. The, the, the key to understanding his revelation. Look again, verse 49, second part. Behold. My mother and my brother, brothers, for they are the ones who should do the will of my Father in heaven. For this one, which one? The one who does the will of my Father in heaven, this one is my brother and my sister and my mother. So if we want to have a familiar relationship. What do I mean by that? So familiar that we're family with Messiah. That we enter into a covenant that makes us part of, and hear this, the very family of God. We do this by understanding the significance of the work of Messiah. His death, burial, and what did he emphasize in this passage? The resurrection. God's confirmation, God's yes to what Yeshua did, everything he did, his words, his teachings, his miracles, his death on the cross, and all of that was sanctioned by God. God put his stamp of authority upon that by raising him from the dead. This is truth. This is what we should seek. This is what we should desire, biblical truth that's focused on Messiah rather than just some miracle. And when we do that, we are going to find ourselves brought into the family of God and behaving as a family member. What is that? Doing the will of the Father. That's what a wife does. That's what a son does. That's what a daughter does. They want to live in a way that brings honor to that man. And in this case, that man is God. Well, we'll close with that. Until next week, Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. <laughs>